think it's going to work. Okay, so, guten Morgen, um, bonjour, good morning to everybody. Uh, ich bin Blaen Verheert, um, um, hier auf der Akademie zu sein. Und ich will die Organisatorin von der Denkensinitiative bedanken für diese Gelegenheit, um zusammen nachzudenken. Und ich will euch bedanken für euch hier zu sein und zu arbeiten, um zu reflektieren über diese Initiative. Um, so, Uh, as I said, I'm very honored uh, to be here, and it's been really a pleasure to work with this group. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick and yours and Ines, uh, for working with us and to all of you uh, for coming to the consultations, many of you, and uh, contributing to our thinking. What I'm going to be doing this morning is to try and cover very briefly the background for this exercise. Yours has already done um, a lot to introduce the problem, and so I will try and go as quickly as I can over this. Then I will um, offer a few reflections on different ways in which we can understand reproducibility. These are, of course, based on some of the conversations with you, but also on a lot of work I've been doing over the last 15 years, uh, looking at these issues in a variety of domains, um, most um, specifically in biology and biomedicine, but collaborating with many colleagues also, in fact, in astronomy, but also in physics and in other parts, um, in, in social science and the humanities. And then I think most importantly, trying to get to some conclusions um, over, or at least provisional um, conclusions and suggestions over what we've actually learned through this exercise and how we may, um, in fact, um, try and think about the future in relation to reproducibility in research. So, uh, to get us started, what is the problem? Uh, I guess uh, much of the discussion around reproducibility has started by um, questioning statistical practices and ways in which people were handling data in research. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion over the last uh, 10 years or so around what were increasingly regarded as questionable uses of statistical techniques to smoothen bias and exclude results that some people may regard as uncomfortable or not quite conforming to the hypothesis that they wanted to push. So things like um, p-hacking, selective reporting, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's also been, you know, arguably, an increase in the complexity and the scale of the experiments carried out, and relatedly, in the kind of statistics that needs to be used to analyze um, the results of these experiments. And in fact, we see in science, anyhow, a very strong trend towards more and more specialization, division of labor, which in turn makes it, in fact, quite difficult um, for researchers to check each other's work and to devise uh, proper avenues, or at least, you know, those become more and more demanding for um, checking the quality and the validity uh, of the methods and the results that are being used uh, by different parts of this complex system. And this also results in a relative confusion, at least in some cases, around the scale of the data analysis that is being used and the extent to which the sources and the types of processing of data involved are trustworthy. And of course, this is linked with this to a situation where uh, there is increasing worry around how effective the practices of, data of quality control that we have in an institutional sense, for instance, in relation to peer review, in relation to uh, the quality of data put on data infrastructures, uh, can in fact be verified. So, um, you know, there are problems with methods, clearly, but perhaps more importantly, this seems to be linked to problems in the incentives that the um, science system is subject to at the moment. Um, you know, we are in a, a culture still of uh, assessing research through an emphasis on um, impact factor and quantitative metrics, uh, very much um, linked to the kind of venue that people publish in and the prestige of that venue. And uh, so much of the credit is attached to these forms of metrics. And this is in situations where researchers publish the results at all. We still have um, a lot of research uh, carried out under sensitive uh, conditions, either because of commercial issues or because uh, the research involves sensitive data that is actually not being published or certainly not in its entirety. There continues to be little reward for collaborative work and for research work which actually is at the service of peers and research communities. This, in fact, is the heart of science, as anybody who uh, has a job in research knows very well, but it tends to be um, not really um, acknowledged. So many people re refer to this work as invisible work in academia. 
And this tends to include uh, things like quality reviews, data curation, uh, accurate reporting of research conditions. These are all very, very important elements for research and research processes and certainly quality assessments. Uh, but again, uh, very little reward for people who devote a lot of time uh, to try and do this properly. And this, of course, links to, more generally, what is perceived to be a lack of transparency and a lack of critical debate around the methods and the data used to produce certain results. And partly because, as I said, it's becoming harder and harder uh, for researchers to scrutinize each other's result. And this scrutiny is not really rewarded uh, properly. Uh, there's also issues with inequity. So uh, we have some much more visible you know, more topical, fashionable, well-funded topics that tend to set standards for what counts as research excellence in a, in a wider sense. And so what happens to research fields and approaches which may not enjoy such visibility and popularity, um, do they just have to follow the standards set by these other domains? And there continues to be very little support for developing technologies, and particularly digital technologies, which are not just effective in a sort of, you know, um, increasing production kind of sense, but in fact are sustainable and can lead to better research practices in the longer term. So the crisis, lots of talk about reproducibility crisis, and um, I think this is very tightly linked to the imaginary and the practice of science as set within a frantic competitive quest for finding new technologies, new medical treatments, and uh, very often regardless of the human and environmental costs of these um, solutions and um, their effect on existing inequities. Um, one could say that secrecy has actually, to some extent, become a default in, in research um, these days, and this is a result both of the ways in which we communicate science and publish science, and the ways in which uh, research tends to be commercialized. And one of the key concerns in scientific communications continues to be who actually owns or at least like, owns control over some of the material that has been shared. And I think actually this is a concern that underpins a lot of the discussions on open science too. Um, there's an increasing reliance on automated and very much black box uh, research systems. And of course, research on artificial intelligence is ex exasperating this trend. So again, an exasperation or division of labor with potentially problematic um, issues around how opaque research methods become and uh, how resistant to scrutiny. And as a result of all of this, there is indeed a growing mistrust of published results, uh, both uh, from uh, people who are outside the scientific world looking in, but also among researchers themselves and among different generations of researchers, which is, of course, a very serious concern. So there is a question about whether we are looking at a situation that is creating permanent damage to the integrity and the ethos of the scientific enterprise, and what can we do about this? And I think that was the motivating um, background for uh, this investigation and certainly for uh, the work that Steve and I have been uh, doing on this topic. So, the idea of reproducibility has been hailed uh, by many different academies, as you have summarized, as a potential um, saving uh, concept in all of this. It comes to the rescue of uh, discussions around best practice in research. And this is because many people recognize reproducibility as a somewhat overarching principle and long-standing value within research, which may not have been discussed in those terms in the history of research, but certainly has been around um, as a concern pretty much throughout the institutionalized history of science over the last 300 years. Let's think about reproducibility maybe in a broad sense for now. So as a general definition, we can think about it as the extent to which consistent results are obtained when a piece of research is repeated in a very broad sense. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion around definitions, of course. Uh, the National Academy of Sciences in, in the US has released a very um, useful report in 2019, which summarizes a lot of the discussions that have happened on this topic so far. And uh, as many others, have also insisted on a distinction between thinking about reproducibility of the research process, the methods, the procedures, the ways in which we get to certain results, and uh, the reproducibility of the outputs of the research, the actual data, the actual claims uh, that we derive from uh, these processes. 
One very common distinction is that between replicability and reproducibility, where replicability is the idea of obtaining consistent results across studies aimed at answering the same scientific questions. And so you can have different kinds of data using different methods, but you want to see uh, some consistency uh, between these results. And the idea of reproducibility, which in a sense is stricter and requires obtaining consistent computational results. So similar types of data, if not the same data, using similar processes. So the same input data, computational steps, methods, code, conditions of analysis. Um, this distinction, of course, is in the background of some of the things that we'll say now. We can come back to it in discussions later today. Um, and of course, there is a very strong link made between reproducibility and the more general idea of open science, where open science tries to push for um, more transparency in research and the free and widespread sharing of information around uh, research processes and conditions, and reproducibility discussions tend to push in a similar direction. So, uh, lots of discussions um, among researchers. There's also been a long, long discussion in so science studies and philosophy of science and history of science around reproducibility. And here is um, one prominent philosopher of science already in 96, stating one of the, I think, fundamental issues in this discussion, which is many assume implicitly or explicitly that successful experiments are or should be reproducible. However, since experiment is a general term for what in fact is a rather complex process, the precise meaning of this assumption is not clear. To clarify the notion of reproducibility, we need to address the following question, the reproducibility of what and by whom. So this is Hans Rader, who also happened to be my PhD uh, supervisor um, back then, exactly in this period. And so I would say this question has guided quite a lot of my research uh, over the last 20 years or so. so one of the things that we want to say is that when one explores this question of reproducibility by, of what and by whom, it, of course it's very important to think about disciplinary differences. This has been the heart of many of the discussions of the pluralism in reproducibility uh, so far. I also think this is not the only use on analysis to think about diversity in research practices and reproducibility assumptions. Of course, these disciplines are a key market for, a marker for differences um, among uh, research practices, but um, there is also a lot of differentiation of research practices and assumptions for the different roles that people play in research. And we've seen a lot of differences between uh, people who are coming to research now, a newer generation, early career researchers, people who have been in the game for a long time and have actually uh, conformed to expectations and credit systems that have been established over the last 30 years, so senior academics, people who work in support roles um, in research, um, librarians, technicians, data scientists, scientists and stewards who are coming to play an ever more important role in not just supporting research, but actually being part um, of research uh, trajectories at the moment. And also, what I certainly found in my research is that um, sometimes research practices within disciplines can be just as diverse and as uh, pluralist in their assumptions as research practices among different disciplines. So careful with just thinking about disciplines as the marker here. And uh, what I want to point to here is that ideas around what counts as reproducibility change also depending on the goals of the specific projects, the methods used, the materials, and more generally the conditions on research. So these are the main factors I've been working on in trying to compare uh, different situations across uh, scientific domains and projects. Um, there are very big differences um, that manifest themselves depending on what degree of control is assumed by researchers over the research conditions and therefore how do they choose their variables and how do they make assumptions about what can and cannot be stabilized within a certain environment. And, and in fact this relates to very big differences on how researchers understand the very idea of variation. And in fact, what is the phenomenon to be explained here? Uh, to which extent variation signals a confounder, error, or actually a very interesting thing to investigate in and of itself. There's also big variation in how people use statistics and computations. So to which extent this is something that is used to validate results, for instance, or to explore uh, certain kinds of data analysis or as inferential tools. There is a big difference, I think, is really key in the precision 
in, uh, that um, researchers um, use in defining the research goals. In some areas, actually very important to have very broad research goals because we are looking at a more exploratory kind of research where the specific target, the hypothesis that researchers use in the research is being defined as empirical research carries on, while in other situations we are looking at very, very targeted, very hypothesis-driven uh, types of research. There is, of course, variation in, this, in the degree to which um, uh, different research enterprises assume a stable background knowledge and evidence-based, and the degree to which um, the research depends on judgments of researchers being actively exercised in the research process. So now I want to focus specifically on the questions of control, the dependence on statistics, the precision of the research goals, and the dependence on researchers' judgment. And I want to try and very briefly go through five different forms of reproducibility, which I think manifest large variations in these four factors. Starting with the idea of computational reproducibility, which also uh, tends to be at the center of many um, of the discussions we're having at the moment, and was at the center of the National Academies of Science report. So, what do we mean by this? Uh, this is a situation where you really do want to be able to reproduce the full process, method, and outcomes uh, of research practices. Researchers focus on finding and resolving mistakes and bugs in data analysis by running the same data through a given set of algorithms over and over again. And of course, this is something that when you're operating within fully computational conditions, you can actually try and do. And of course, for research of this kind, the idea that you have access to open and reusable code and data is absolutely essential. And this is one of the very famous standard graphs used to illustrate uh, the move towards full replication, which happens when uh, you have linked and executable code and data and represents, uh, for this kind of literature, the gold standard for research. Now, for this kind of understanding of reproducibility, what you're assuming is, in fact, pretty much total degree of control over research conditions. Whether this is the case actually is a discussion for a different day or for the rest of today, um, in fact, but that's the assumption typically made. A very, very high dependence, of course, on statistics as an inferential tool, a reasoning tool, um, on top of everything else, and high precision of research goals, and to some extent, a low dependence on researchers' judgment. Again, I'm talking about the assumptions made as a precondition to the research. I don't think this is necessarily descriptive of what happens in these practices. Uh, we can have that discussion later. Now, contrast this with a situation where you have highly standardized experiments, which, however, are highly materialized. These are not fully computational systems. We are now moving to the material world uh, with, of course, uh, strong support from uh, computation. Clinical trials are a quintessential um, exemplar for this kind of research. What we have here is an idea that many refer to as direct experimental reproducibility, the idea that you can obtain the same results by repeatedly applying the same research methods and processes. Now, in this situation, what you have is an assumption of a high degree of control of research conditions, not total, but certainly quite high, Again, high dependence on statistics as an inferential tool, high precision of the research goals, and low dependence on researchers' judgment. And now things get a little bit more complex. Let's start to consider uh, experiments which are not quite as highly standardized as something like a clinical trial, and for a very good reason, because we in fact cannot um, and don't want to standardize experiments to that, uh, to that uh, level, because there's lots of things that we need to discover about what the right conditions of research would be to explore certain questions. So this is a situation of what we may call semi-standardized experiments. Experiments where the methods, setups, and materials are construed with a lot of ingenuity to yield very specific outcomes, and some significant parts of the experimental setup necessarily elude the control set up by experimenters because it's part of what we are trying to investigate in the first place. So things like preclinical pre research are a very good example of this. Experiments on model organisms, which are very highly standardized models uh, with very refined techniques, um, uh, developed to tailored towards working on them, and yet we still know so little about these organisms despite spending decades investigating their functioning. Um, research in developmental biology and physiology, many psychological experiments uh, also. What's going on here? 
Here we have a situation where, in fact, uh, many of these factors become variable. There is quite a big variation in the degree of control that researchers assume they have over research conditions. In some cases, it can be quite low, actually, and researchers are happy to acknowledge this. There's also a variable dependence on statistics as inferential tool that can take many forms, uh, depending on the kind of research. The precision of the research goals is limited. Uh, sometimes the precision is actually um, very constrained precisely because you want to um, improve your grasp of what it is that you're actually studying as you advance your research. And again, there can be a relatively high dependence on researchers making judgments as the research proceeds. And in fact, we can think about at least three different types of reproducibilities um, linked to this type of research. Very briefly, the idea that I've been calling scoping reproducibility. This is where you repeat the same experiment precisely to spot differences in the results. And, um, and these differences in experimental results are in fact um, very precious to you because they allow you to identify and study potential sources of variation that may prove significant to your process of discovery and when interpreting the data. There's also this idea of indirect reproducibility um, that Hans Rudder and many others, Harry Collins and so forth, have discussed. The idea that you can obtain similar results from the performance of different experiments and that can constitute a useful validation tool. So you can see which results are actually being confirmed and uh, converge, if you want, uh, by applying uh, different techniques um, under variable circumstances. And then there's also this idea of hypothetical reproducibility, um, which is um, discussed by Felipe Romero in, um, uh, in detail. And this is the attempt to obtain outcomes of research that match outcomes predicted as implications of previous findings. So you're thinking about projections uh, that you can make about what you may predict uh, good results could be based on previous research, and then use those projections uh, as a comparison for results that you obtain in research you do afterwards, which also can help you to confirm the reliability of previous findings. So far, so good. I think we're still within the realm of discussions that are more um, you know, generally seen in relation to reproducibility. I want to just point to another two forms of reproducibility that may be, I think, in, in my view, highly underrated. The first is the idea of reproducible expertise. And this is something that we see happening when you have research which happens under very uh, non-standard conditions, um, experiments that are very, very expensive, so very, very difficult to actually replicate in an obvious sense, or research that happens with rare materials which are difficult to access and are highly depletable. So what you have there is a shift from an emphasis on the research process and the outcomes of research to the skills that researchers bring to this kind of research. So the expectation here is that any skilled researchers working with the same methods and the same type of materials at a particular time and place would produce similar results. The emphasis on reproducible expertise, reproducible skills by researchers. This is something you very, very often see in historical sciences, paleontology, archaeology, history, and in research which is highly exploratory, where people have to take decisions at every step around how do they actually construe the research environment. And there is, of course, centuries worth of research techniques meant to enhance this particular meaning of reproducibility. Many opposite uh, methodologies developed to cope with the impossibility to directly reproduce the findings. Here I just mentioned a few, vetted access, um, cross samples research, the idea of centralizing research with many different researchers working together and checking each other's results. There's many, many more. But the interesting thing to, high, to note here is that there is a clear assumption that there is a high dependence in this research on researchers' judgment, and that judgment is trustworthy because it's actually skilled judgment, and everything else is actually highly variable. Finally, the idea of reproducible observation. This is really going to the other end of the spectrum. The typical example of this are things like fieldwork in ethology, for instance, or ethnographic research in anthropology and other uh, qualitative social sciences. Here, what we're thinking about is trying to um, Think about non-experimental descriptions of case studies. Another interesting example is the use of uh, medical reports, case reports in medicine, actually. So here we have the expectation that any researchers with similar skills placed in the same time and place 
would pick out, if not the same data, because the conditions under which their work change so dramatically day on day, um, you know, year on year, but at least the same overarching patterns. And that can still actually be seen as a form of reproducibility. And here, obviously, we have assumptions about low degree of control over research conditions, low dependence on statistics, low precision on research goals, and very high dependence on researcher judgment. And here is sort of, you can see, we've gone through thinking about uh, idea reproducibility, which goes you know, very high on these four categories and very low on dependence on judgment to pretty much the opposite side of the spectrum, thinking about reproducible observation. Now, why taking time today to go through these ideas? is because I think, and certainly uh, discussions with you have confirmed that impression quite strongly, that what we are looking at in discussion of reproducibility is a situation where very highly controlled experiments with pre-specified goals uh, which work for particular situations, uh, like you know, trialing very already um, very narrowed, very uh, precise um, research targets, have come to exemplify much more generally what constitutes best practice and rigorous research um, in science. I don't think that's a very good thing at all, because this prejudice is now doing very little justice to other research methods that may be just as rigorous, but don't conform in you know, the ways in which research is conducted, in its goals, and its targets, and its processes, to these expectations. And these tend to be uh, research environments, which of course are already under attack for many other reasons, partly political, uh, in the current research landscape. Qualitative traditions that focus on an analysis of situated, basically, irrepeatable, constantly changing um, conditions, and exploratory quantitative research. Incidentally, a lot of work happening around big data of exploratory type, data mining, also falls in the category of research that is potentially penalized under these conditions, which is, uh, you know, I think an interesting situation. So we're looking at a very narrow interpretation of reproducibility in some of these discussions, which I think this discussion we're having here is a good opportunity to try and overcome. And we're looking very often at people saying, oh, there's this big dichotomy between hermeneutic approaches where people basically just care about their own subjective assumptions and quantitative approaches where everything is great and safe from subjective judgment. And I mean, certainly for my research, this completely falls apart. Uh, there's a lot of subjective judgments happening in how we set up AI models, and there is actually very rigorous methods used in hermeneutic type research, depending on who carries it out, of course. Um, so this narrow interpretation of reproducibility is unhelpful in the sense that it actually devalues the role of expertise and embodied knowledge in data production, processing, and assessment. And in fact, it downplays the significance of social context and the way we set up research across all domains. And I mean, one of the cases that came up uh, several times in our consultations with many of you was a case of you know, what happens when a study needs to be completely redesigned in order to be replicated because social context has changed. On the one hand, this counts as a very interesting form of replication. At the same time, if you, think, if you adopt this narrow understanding, this just doesn't work, right? This doesn't count as replication at all. Most importantly, I think this narrow understanding of reproducibility does not help you to target some of the problems I've listed at the beginning of this talk and Jos was referring to. It doesn't really help you to distinguish between unintentional mistakes made in research that you want to try and weed out, actual active cheating and fraud, just questions of difference in research conditions, um, constructive questioning of accepted facts, you know, basically the basis of scientific research in the first place, versus malicious questioning of the type that Steve will be uh, discussing uh, later this afternoon. We've seen also quite a lot of conceptual confusions happening here. So um, there is a sort of a melting pot um, in discussion of reproducibility. People think, tend to think about reproducibility in close connection to, for instance, the generalizability of research results. And I think that is actually misguided. I mean, this is a different problem, whether or not the scope of your research is applicable across domains and across research situations is really not the same as the quality that is of the research you carry out. So I think the discussion around whether or not research has a broad scope and is generalizable to other domains should be separate from the question about whether the particular results are of high quality and uh, trustworthy. 
There's also a link to the idea of sharing, which is also potentially a false herring, um, so a red herring here. So uh, making research accessible, research results accessible, does not necessarily automatically improve the quality of research uh, because it still it doesn't really help you with the question of how those research results get scrutinized and help the making of future research. What makes a difference is how we reuse and uh, how we think about, um, in fact, how we discriminate and prioritize among uh, what is worth sharing, both in terms of data and processes. And again, this question of transparency, um, we have seen an imbalance of requirements uh, posed on publicly funded research and privately sponsored research. And also there are questions around to which extent mere transparency can help you to deal with reproducibility. Also, We've seen uh, in our uh, discussions that ideas of reproducibility actually do not cover all of the concerns to do with the invisible work in academic work and in research in general. Uh, we've seen researchers talk about problems of scaling up research and optimizing the research results, for instance, when trying to um, adapt software from a smaller pool down for particular um, pilot examples to, for instance, a large patient pool or a kind of optimization in, on a mass scale. Uh, all of this work is enormous and is not really being rewarded um, in, in, in current uh, research assessments. Work around transdisciplinarity, absolutely essential in trying to make research more robust, more resilient in the longer term, but again, uh, very seldom uh, really facilitated, particularly because this kind of work requires long-term support venues and time and resources for researchers to learn to exchange insights across fields. And of course, uh, there's a big question around the translational gap that I'm sure you're all uh, very aware of. So what does it mean to get research uh, incentives right, and particularly in the Flemish situation that we've observed uh, over the last few months? There's a sense in which, of course, there are big efforts being made to try and think about the research system as a whole. And that was great for us to see that there is a sense of this being a systemic problem. But of course, uh, as everywhere else, to be fair, uh, many of these continue to lag behind. So there is still a strong obsession with metrics within the Belgian system, as much as uh, people, of course, say that they're trying to move away from it. It's still a system where particularly early career researchers are assessed through counting up uh, their publications and looking at impact factor, which personally I think is incredibly unhelpful uh, given these issues. Um, even in places where metrics are being complemented by qualitative evaluations, I mean, University of Ghent, for instance, has, has done lots of um, um, strides in that respect, but in fact, most universities in um, Flanders are really trying uh, to think about this. There continues to be an emphasis on novel research, and you know, there is a big question around what actually constitutes, particularly for funding bodies. Um, reviewing activities continue to be invisible work. They're volunteer, they're unrewarded, which particularly when it comes to uh, data sharing is a big issue. Um, there is an emphasis on transparency, a very strong emphasis on transparency, in fact, you know, making everything open, slapping everything up on a website um, for publicly funded researchers, much less so, if at all, uh, for um, researchers funded by industry, and uh, Steve will come back to this uh, later this afternoon. And there is a sense that generalizable results are favored over results that may have a narrower scope, but in fact may be more robust and much more easy to verify. And this situation prompts all sorts of conflicts, interests, and goals among various parts of the research landscape. So we've seen conflicts between junior staff and senior staff, both in support roles and in research um, in universities. Students who tend to be very susceptible to ideas around reproducibilities and trying to make the research high quality, but are subject to these very difficult constraints. Supervisors who may be either resilient to adopt some of these ideas or just feel that this is not in the best interest of the uh, people that they're mentoring. Um, it creates co difficulties in collaborations across institutions and particularly across countries in situations where different countries are adopting different policies when it comes to these issues. Obviously, collaborations between different disciplines uh, are problematic. Uh, collaborations between academics and professional staff 
at universities with these roles changing in time. And I think, for instance, the role of a data steward, which thankfully we saw is being adopted more and more at Flemish universities, is also actually acquiring more prominence as a proper component of research. And this needs to be recognized, but how? <laughs> Are these people becoming co-authors in papers? Not quite yet, right? So I think we're still in the process of figuring out what this transformation of the research landscape actually means um, for the relationship between um, these um, uh, individuals and groups. Obviously, there is a question around the relationship between industry and academia that Steve will touch upon later on. More generally, people are asking themselves, how do we build a research culture of open discussion when everybody in this climate of crisis tends to be monitoring everybody else for signs of bad faith, right? So I think one of the messages here is to trying to potentially move away from this idea of bad faith and kind of um, locating the cheats and try to think more broadly about uh, what kind of changes are needed in the research environment. So um, in terms of you know, potentially uh, more um, uh, constructive steps, Certainly there are questions around how do we recognize these issues, of course, that's uh, issue number one in many ways, and how do we recognize this kind of work substantively? There has been an emphasis on prizes and badges associated to people who do reproducible research and engage in open science practices. This is partly, of course, it's at least it's a step, so that's good, um, but it pretty much lends itself to be gamed also. We've seen people protesting around this becoming a and yet another way in which people may do what they nicely called open washing. So uh, the question becomes, you know, can we do something more substantive than just lapping a badge on people that may be recognized for a particular initiative? Um, in terms of funding, um, you know, obviously the, the, FAO, the FWO already told us that they're trying to increase their emphasis on research integrity and how this is assessed. They call it the second axis of assessment, and this is great. There's also an increasing emphasis on value in negative results, which I thought also was fantastic and great way to think about these issues. The bigger question continues to be, what counts as new ideas, right? Because the idea of reaching novelty still drives a lot of the funding. And I think, you know, uh, question, I mean, the idea of reproducibility should um, put this into question to some extent. What constitutes new ideas versus, for instance, new methods or new infrastructures or, you know, continuing or maintaining infrastructures in innovative ways. How do we support transdisciplinary research? Um, again, there's a beginning of that, but also partly for, because of the way in which uh, research panels are construed. This continues to be very difficult. Again, this is really not just a Flemish uh, issue. This is common to uh, many funding bodies around the world. And um, assessment panels are, you know, play a very important role here. How do we train these panels? And of course, in Flanders, it's particularly interesting and potentially complex because your assessment panels are mostly composed by foreign um, evaluators, and so there's going to be a lot of different ideas around what counts as good research coming together in these panels. Training is crucial both for researchers, for panelists, for professional staff, but doesn't resolve all the issues because it's not just a matter of changing research culture here. There are much more structural issues at play that in fact prevent very often researchers on the ground, particularly early career researchers from um, actually adopting some of these um, ideas. And it's very, very important, I think, in this uh, context, not to let the full weight of reproducibility requirements fall on researchers' shoulders, and particularly young researchers' shoulders, which has somewhat been, you know, is the temptation always uh, in these kinds of discussions. And obviously, the idea of support, that's already, we've seen that really making headways in Flanders, which is really fantastic. It can become even stronger in terms of really recognizing the importance of data steward and integrity officers. And here I want to flag the fact that aside from, of course, providing crucial expertise, we've seen over and over again in our discussions uh, these um, types of individuals and support being flagged as very helpful in mediating the kind of conflict I referred to before. Right? So it's not just a question of you know, providing you with the tools you need, but in fact helping people having a constructive dialogue around uh, ways forward which are targeted and tailored to the specific situation they find themselves in. I'm running out of time, so I'm probably not going to go through the example of pre-registration, which is a pity because that was one of the very interesting um, uh, discussions that we had, um, especially thanks to the, the producibility um, a group in Leuven who did such wonderful work in, in helping us to think about this issue. Anyhow, I just want to flag the fact that very often the idea of pre-registration is flagged as you know, a way of um, just resolving the reproducibility discussion by providing some sort of blueprint for research that people write down and then they should be assessed 
uh, in terms of how closely they stuck to that uh, research design that they decided at the beginning of the research. And in fact, this is highly problematic for pretty much almost every type of reproducibility I've listed, possibly except for computational reproducibility. And so the question becomes, can we think about pre-registration rather as an opportunity to explicitly formulate research designs and methods, explicitly ask people to reflect on the assumptions they're making, including assessing risks and foreseeable problems in the research, um, in a way that's actually complementary to data management plans and ethical reviews, and in a way that uh, enables a better scrutiny of how research is carried out step by step in different stages, but doesn't necessarily hold researchers to actually stick to that format. Um, so, just as a key message here, pre-registration could be used very um, usefully as a way to formalize and remember the rationale for specific choices at a given moment of the research process, but it's really not very useful to think about it as a straight tool for research quality assessment, um, which is just a matter of comparing plans and outcomes and seeing how close that they match. So conclusions, how does the pursuit of reproducibility help address the scientific crisis uh, that we talked about? Um, I've tried to argue here that the idea of reproducibility is some sort of overarching epistemic value, particularly when we stick to this idea of computational reproducibility as the best standard, is not uh, particularly helpful and is certainly not a magic formula for resolving the problems of science. It doesn't necessarily fix concerns around research quality, doesn't provide a universal solution, and doesn't actually help to address systemic issues. However, discussions around reproducibility in this richer sense provide a really wonderful platform and an important stepping stone to actually address these broader systemic concerns in research. And uh, particularly uh, the fact that researchers tend to lack incentive and resources to discuss their methodological commitments, uh, to discuss how they learn from mistakes and problems happening in everyday practices, how they document these mistakes and these problems, and which strategies are used to choose which resource components need to be preserved in the long term and how. Reproducibility discussions of the type that you're now setting up in the reproducibility network in Flanders are really a fantastic starting point to tackle these issues. And if that could be the research direction um, for Flanders and you know, the strategic direction in the next few years, uh, I think that would be extremely productive. Um, it's also an important way of trying and bring open science and research back, and particularly focus on open science as a way to um, um, help community participation and thinking more broadly about the benefits of science for society and how do we actually engage different parts of society in the making of resources rather just as, as sort of um, beneficiaries at the end of it. Obviously a way to think about how we rethink the credit system to give much more proper credit to the invisible work carried out particularly by early career academics and uh, various types of technician and support staff and move away from the emphasis on short-term outcomes of research and think a little bit further about the sustainability and the robustness of our research landscape, especially now that we come to depend so strongly on digital infrastructures, uh, many of which actually we really have no idea how can be sustained even just in a five to 10 year um, uh, time horizon. So with this, I thank you very much. And I don't know whether we can have maybe five minutes for questions, if there are any given that we started a little bit later. Uh, but I leave that to the organizers. Thank you.